Okay, now we've got a, um, a, a, a something completely different um, and a slight adjustment to the agenda in that Stephen and Susanna are going to um, behave as a double act. They're going to tag team and they're going to take their, uh, their time all together intermingled and then we'll have one uh, session for questions at the end. And if you need a volunteer to be sawn in half, then Larry's sitting right there. Thank you for having us. This is uh, exciting um, for us, and uh, we're very grateful for, for your interest in our work. I hope the rest of you will find this interesting. I think it's, um, it's not so different than you might think than what you've been talking about, especially since a lot of the questions we've heard, especially, for example, in the last talk, the last slide uh, with kind of the summary of the, of the issues with the Nestle Institute is that uh, with time, we'll accomplish some of the issues with genetics and, and drugs. But two-thirds of the slide was about irrational behavior. Eat less, move more, and here you all are on Saturday morning drinking coffee with cream. And uh, you're about to eat a cookie. Um, so the, the point here is that um, with respect, that institute and, and all of the things that we're doing here with pharmaceuticals are amazingly important, but they're not everything that you need to solve for, for you to fix any of these things that you're trying to solve. That irrational behavior, even in some of these neurological diseases that we're talking about, is something that can't be uh, put aside as a separate issue that psychiatrists will deal with. This is something that's in integral, especially when your patients may not take 60% of their drugs. <laughs> And so, let's talk about irrational behavior. Let's talk about illusions, wh what illusions are, and why it is that they're absolutely critical to what all of you are doing. Okay. So, um, first we'll talk about kind of illusions of sensory perception. We'll start there. It's a little easier to understand. You can see it uh, in your own brains right now. And, and um, let's start off with kind of the fundamental issue with illusions. Is everything an illusion? And in the next hour and a half, we hope to show you that, in fact, it is. So uh, the, the finest explanation of this, or the finest uh, description, uh, came from one of the world's greatest philosophers, Keanu Reeves. And I'll play you that movie now. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Now, Keanu only asked, is this real? And that was the end of it. But that's a very good question that you should all be asking yourselves about every single thing you ever do, OK? And the reason is because everything that you have ever seen, felt, thought, tasted, imbibed, was interpreted by a part of your brain, a subset of your brain, that receives sensory impulses from your sensory systems. Electrochemical signals travel from your eyes, your ears, your skin. Those come into the brain. Information from your memory systems, your cognitive systems, causal inference get mixed into a subset of the brain, which we don't understand yet, that builds a grand illusion of the world outside. And that illusion, that simulation of the world, is the only thing that you have ever interacted with, ever, or ever will. You've never seen the real world, and you never will. And so understanding how it is that this grand simulation of what it is outside your body uh, works is absolutely critical to understanding what we are, what consciousness is, what life is. And certainly, it's important to understanding how to improve quality of life in medicine. So um, we're not saying that the outside world isn't out there. It is. But you've never lived there, OK? You've never even been there for a visit. And so let's talk about how we can prove that to you now. So Keanu had an important decision to make in the movie The Matrix. He was offered the red pill, in which case he would take it and he would wake up from his computer-induced dream and come out into the real world. 
and or he could take the blue pill and remain in the matrix. And he decided to take the red pill, um, but what Morpheus forgot to tell him is that by taking the red pill, he may actually come out of the computer-induced dream, but he'd still remain in the matrix of his own mind. And that's something that we all have to live with. And so let's talk a little bit about how that works. First, what is an illusion? And what do we mean by illusion? We don't actually mean deceit and trickery and uh, how it is that we can overcome those things. Although that's part of, of human interaction, as we'll talk about in the, in the second half of our talk about magic. What we mean by illusion is anything where the subjective perception does not match the reality, which is virtually everything that you've ever experienced, okay? So examples include you see something that's not there, okay? Spain saw profits and income and reported those to the EU that were not there. <laughs> Fail to see something that is there, or you can see something different from what is there. So let's talk about how this can happen in the visual system and understanding how illusions are critical, understanding how our brains construct not just visual experience, but all experience. So this is what I mean by visual illusion. These are um, beautiful people, okay? By all accounts, beautiful people. And uh, what I want you to do though is Instead of looking right at the faces of the beautiful people as I show them, what I want you to do is I want you to fixate at this cross. You can't quite see it yet, but there'll be a cross here. I want you to fixate your gaze on that cross, okay? And don't move your eyes, but pay attention to the faces. And let me know if you see anything strange, okay? Here we go. Keep looking. Oh, they're gorgeous, aren't they? Now. We haven't made any changes to the photographs you're about to see, but stay on the cross, paying attention to the faces. And what do you see? Do you see a bunch of freakish faces? Because <laughs> that's what I see, okay? So what's happening here is with each face, we're activating your fusiform gyruses face cells. These neurons are being activated and what's happening is by virtue of their activation, when another face comes on with different facial properties, some of those neurons are adapted and some of them aren't. So you see parts of the face well and parts of the face are adapted and you recognize them as monstrous, okay? Some of us look like this anyway. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you, we're gonna play exactly the same movie. Anybody who understands PowerPoint, nothing up my sleeves, I'm pushing the button again, okay? Now, don't look at the cross, just look at the faces, okay? Look back and forth, every time the slide changes, just stay looking at these people and you'll see them as the A-list actors to whom you pay $12 a week, okay? They're, they're the gorgeous people you're used to. As long as you look from one to the other, and you don't fixate adapting your face cells of your, of your fusiform gyrus, this is an illusion, okay? This is what I mean by visual illusion. This, this specific type of illusion happens only in your brain. It's not, ha it's not has nothing to do with the physical reality at all, okay? It only happens by virtue of the way your brain processes information. So, how does our brain deceive us? Uh, neural limitations lead to neural deceptions. For example, we fill in the blanks, these are all good things, okay? You know, all good things that are absolutely critical life. I'm gonna show you another illusion right now. This is a good one for cocktail parties, okay? So straighten out your elbows and put your thumbs together, everybody, okay? Now, you, you all look like an ass, but that's okay. I'm gonna do it too. <laughs> now, put your fingers up like this, okay? Now, at arm's length, if you close your left eye and look at your right finger, sorry, look at your left fingertip, your right finger will disappear. Okay, stay looking at your left fingernail, but pay attention to the right finger and it should be gone. If it's not, just move it around a little bit until it disappears into the blind spot of your right eye, okay? Now what's cool about this is you can see your finger leave your hand and go up and then disappear into the blind spot of your right retina. And you can see, if you do it again, put your hands up again, pay attention, you see your finger disappears and you can see what's behind your finger, right? Is that possible? Do you have a blind spot or do you have x-ray vision where you're... It's not possible. 
Your brain takes the information from around the blind spot and uses it to fill in the blanks, very close to the center of your vision, where you've never seen anything in your entire life, yet you can't see it. If you close an eye, you can't see a blind spot, right? Your visual system and your cognitive systems are doing this for you all the time, filling in the blanks so that you can see things that aren't really there and in your data. <laughs> we also seek structure. And we also serve to improve narratives. And I'll explain this a little more as we go, but it'll make sense as we, as we see them. So filling in blanks. So here we have an illusion called the Kinesa Triangle, in which there are no lines here, here, or here, but you see a triangle. And when you rotate these images in the back, you actually see a pyramid in three dimensions that doesn't actually exist, okay? So you're just seeing basically the corners of a three-dimensional pyramid, and then this hint of a corner here, and you see this rotating pyramid. And this is an example of how our brain fills in the blanks to make sense of nonsensical data, because this kind of shape doesn't really exist in nature. So your brain's trying to make it work for you. When we seek structure, we do things like this. So you see all this kind of disorder here and disorder here, okay? Now, if you fixate right there and hold your gaze as still as possible, I think it works a little better with one eye, but it's up to you. If you do that, while you fixate, you'll notice after about 10 to 20 seconds that the entire grid will be completely ordered. It's no longer disordered, okay? Just like the genotyping of some of your patients. Okay. So, so that's incredible that your brain does this for you, okay? What about improving narratives? Well, here we have a, a condition called choice blindness. This has to do with how we confabulate to ourselves all the time. For example, when we decide to put Nestle's chocolate powder into our milk, <laughs> okay? And the decisions that are critical when we apply any of these drug treatments or food treatments to what we're doing. So this is a case where uh, Johansson and Lars and their colleagues at the University of Lund were asking about confabulation and they used magic to do it, okay? They had these two uh, images of two young women, and, and the subject had to ask, say, which one of these was more attractive? Previously, they'd already been matched for attractiveness, so they were basically equally attractive every time, okay? Um, according to a group. And so when you, when you look at these, you choose one, and then the subject had to point to which one they liked the best. The card was passed to them, and then they had to say why they chose this card. But if you notice, the card that was passed to them was not the one they chose 20% of the time. And we were interested, or the, the experimenters were interested in what the subject now said, because most of the time, they didn't notice the swap and they would uh, basically expound on the virtues of this person over the other one, okay? So this is how we confabulate to explain ourselves, even to ourselves, after we make a decision, okay, and why that was a good decision. So for example, some of the subject's comments, she's radiant, I would rather have approached her at a bar than the other one, and I like earrings. She didn't, he didn't choose the earrings, okay? She's the one without the earrings. She looks like an aunt of mine, I think, and she seems nicer than the other one, okay? Well, not true. Um, Yes, well, she looks very hot in this picture, okay? Well, post hoc, but nice. So, just a nice shape of the face and chin. I thought she had more personality in a way, not true. She was most appealing to me. Again, that's a lie, okay? So, uh, I don't know. Finally, an honest answer. Okay, so, uh, why did I choose her? She looks very masculine. Well, it's because you didn't choose her, because she looked masculine. <laughs> So, and if you think you don't do this and you wouldn't be caught, you're wrong, unless you're one of the 20% that didn't get fooled by this, okay? So let's talk about visual illusions. They're very easy to understand relatively in terms of brain activity. So here's a great illusion that was a winner of the uh, best illusion of the year cost that we put on every year. Um, what you do is you fixate this dot, okay? 
And what you'll notice is that this is causing adaptation, just like the face illusion I just showed you. Now these objects are causing adaptation in your brain, and when they turn off, you'll see after images, okay? So fixate this dot, and when they turn off, you'll see red and green after images, afterwards, right? Inside the shapes that are turning, okay? But what's interesting is that you see the red after image in the object that was previously green in reality, and you see the red after image in the diagonal one, okay? And they're after images. These after images were put on your retina before the, the individual objects were actually shown. So your brain is after the fact, not only showing you the after images, but only the after images that are the opposite of the shape that fit that color, right? That is freaking weird. So, so what's happening here is those neurons are becoming adapted. They're firing less than their neighbors, and that's in terms of the colors we see as well. So what that means is when you see an afterimage, that you see the opposite color. When you see a flash bulb, you see a black spot, for example, this is the same kind of thing. But what's happening is it's not that easy because this is showing the brain actually fits it into the right shape as well. Okay, brightness and color illusions are kind of like this. So here we have a, you know, a chessboard with a can of soda on it lit from this corner, okay? So you see a shadow. And, and this is very nice, it's by Ted Adelson at, at, at MIT, and you see that this checkerboard piece is dark and this one's white, right? Wrong. These two things, the B and the B, are precisely, precisely the same color of gray, okay? And the only reason they look different is because of your brain, okay? If I take away everyth everything else in the screen, keep your eyes on it so you Believe me, take off everything else in the screen, but keep keeping an eye on those two chips. They're exactly the same, okay? And if I printed this out and you cut out the pieces and lay them on top of each other, that would be true, okay? So this is your brain trying to interpret your environment appropriately for what it needs to do to act. And so it sees that this should be a light one and this should be a dark one. And maybe this one just has this amount of darkness because of the shading. And so we should interpret the surface as light rather than dark. Okay, shape illusions. This, these are Legos, okay? As you know, the Danish can't make curved Legos. <laughs> These are actually completely straight, okay? Rectangular Legos. But when you lay them out in this, in this organization, you see a bulge in the middle that doesn't actually exist, except in your fragile little minds, okay? So, so this is easily provable. You all have children or grandchildren, presumably, or nieces and nephews, so try it. It's amazing. You can use this information for evil, okay? So, <laughs> and designers have done so. So you can um, use this information in camouflage or you can use it to, to make things look like they don't actually look, as in fashion design. And you can also see this in ambiguous figures. This is one of my favorite historical illusions. Um, when Napoleon was exiled, he still had supporters in France, but it was illegal to support Napoleon. So they would pass around this illusion, it's called violets, I think. I, do you remember the actual name of the card? Yeah, so we're looking at violets now, but you're also looking at Napoleon, his wife, and his daughter. And so this is how support, supporters knew. So you can see Napoleon, oops, you can see Napoleon with his crazy hat right here. His wife's over there. And there's his daughter, right? So you can also use this information to, to make what's called impossible figures, but things have moved forward now so it's not just impossible figures, but impossible objects that people actually make in three dimensions. This is a real object and it looks just like that, okay? Obviously impossible, okay? 
How do you make that is the question. And um, we wrote an article about this in Scientific American on these, on these objects. And uh, we were very surprised to find that it was the, it's the most downloaded article in Scientific American history of everything. <laughs> because people were so puzzled by this. So here's another one by Hans Schepker. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, but when you look at it from the wrong angle, you see the secret. <laughs> so you have to be a little clever and see it from an accidental view that is from a specific perspective. But that's true for much of what we think and do on a daily basis, right? How many people have accidentally hit pedestrians and motorcycles because they were behind the strut in their car and couldn't see them, or we're just looking for other cars and not paying attention to people and motorcycles. That's another way to change your perspective in a dangerous way. And our doctors do that as well and have to be very careful about this as well, but receive no training on that kind of issue, except through drilling, medical school, residency, and basically it's hoped that with this kind of training it goes away. But there's no explicit training on these types of issues. There should be. This is a magician named Jerry Andrus, who we admire very much. He used visual illusions in his magic, and we'll show you another one of his illusions later. And you can see him standing inside this crate that is impossible, right? Take a good look at it. This strut is in front of that one, which obviously can't ha happen, and he's actually inside the thing. So how does that actually work? Well, again, it's a issue of point of view. If you look at it from the right angle, that's what it looks like. So, another uh, ambiguous, uh, impossible figure. This one's in Perth, Australia, an absolutely beautiful sculpture of a Penrose Triangle um, in front of this building here. And uh, from this perspective, it, it's definitely impossible for that to exist. And uh, when you look at it from the correct angle, you'll see the extent to which the architect went to make that work. <laughs> And uh, you don't, it's not only this shape, there's, a, there's an infinite number of ways to make this illusion, and this is another one in Alphoven, Belgium. It's just fantastic. It just looks wonderful from that perspective. <clears throat> so let me talk about invisibility illusions, then I'll hand it over to Susanna to finish this talk. Um, this is a, an example of motion-induced blindness, and uh, this is incredible. What happens, we don't have an explanation for this illusion yet, so it's one of my favorites because we don't know how it works. Um, what you do, what's that? Oh, okay, oh yeah. Could, is it possible to turn the lights off quickly? If it is, great, if not, okay, here he is. he's running, and there we go, okay. So, can everybody see the blue field in the back? Okay, so what you do is you fixate the green flashing dot in the center. And while you look at this, again, this is one of those things I think works a little better with one eye closed, but it, you can use both if you like. If you look at the green spot, what will happen is, as pay attention to the yellow dots, and they will disappear and then come back sometimes. Just completely gone from your consciousness, just like your money in Las Vegas. Okay? So this is an example. It doesn't work as well when it's not moving. And this is an illusion that I especially like because I invented it. It's called the standing wave of invisibility. And in this illusion, we address a fundamental way that neurons in the visual system interact with each other both in a positive and an inhibitory way. And by understanding the timing by which excitation and inhibition interact, we were able to make this bar, which I hope you agree is very salient, this bar disappear and turn invisible, okay? So if we look at this bar, what'll happen is when I bring the outer bars in, which I'll call masks, the middle bar will disappear. So it's, it's gone, it's there, it's gone. Hola, adios, okay? Now, what I want you to do, I want to prove that this is happening in your brain, it's not a computer trick. Uh, I want you to, to look at that sprinkler head above the screen. Can everybody see that or is that behind something? You can see it? Okay. Look at that and pay attention to this bar. Okay? You see it? Now let me know when that bar disappears. Okay? It'll happen at different times for people in the front and the back. 
gone? How about in the front? It's gone? Okay, now look at the bar. Now look up at the fire um, sprinkler. Look at the bar. It's still there. I'm not touching anything. Okay, I'm not controlling your eyes or eyelids. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to look up to where it's gone. Look up there while it's gone and blink your eyes about as fast as I'm blinking mine and sometimes the bar will come back because you've disrupted the interference from the masks. Who here thinks that I control their eyelids? <laughs> None of you? Well, that's where you're wrong, okay? But nevertheless, uh, I'm not doing it right now. So, so these are examples of illusions that happen in your brain due to fundamental processes in your early sensory systems, okay? And in your mid-level systems like face cells, okay? These are the same circuits that operate in your cognitive systems, the same brain cells. If you cut out a piece of the brain, a chunk, and take it from decision-making frontal lobe areas, and you put it next to a chunk from the primary visual cortex, and you ask the most famous neurobiologist in the world to take a look at those cells and tell you which one that came from, they wouldn't be able to tell you. Well, they probably would with the case of B1, but nevertheless. <laughs> If you took it out of auditory cortex, it wouldn't work. And that's because, more or less, cortex looks like cortex looks like cortex. It's the same circuits everywhere. They just have different inputs and outputs, and so they process different levels of cognition versus sensation. And so these things are very relevant to how we think and feel. You can turn up the lights now. So with that, I will hand it over to Susanna until my, my turn in a little while again. Thank you. All right, so Steve has uh, shown us uh, a number of illusions and uh, that we study in the, in the laboratory. Illusions are great in neuroscience. Um, they're really good handles, good tools to let us know the mechanisms, the operations, the algorithms that the brain is using to construct this uh, experience, this simulation of the world. But a lot of the illusions that we study in the laboratory don't come from science. They haven't been created by scientists. They come from artists and from their intuitions about how the human mind and the human perception work. So let me show you uh, a couple of examples. So, so first off, the rules of perspective. The rules of perspective come from intuitions that artists in the Renaissance developed. The fact that parallel lines appear to converge in the distance or that objects that are closer to us appear to be larger than objects that are farther away. These uh, principles work, they allow us to see depth and volume on a flat canvas and the reason they work when we look at a painting is the same reason that, we, that they work when we look at the world because the fact is our experience of 3D is illusory. It's a brain construct. Our brain simulates 3D for us. There is 3D in the world. Uh, objects have actual volume. However, our two retinas are bidimensional surfaces. And from this information, the brain uses two main types of mechanisms. Um, uses uh, principles of perspective, such as occlusion. If one object occludes partially another object, we conclude that the non-occluded object is in front and the partially occluded object is, is in the back. These are what we call monocular cues of perception. You can see them, you can perceive them with either one eye closed or with both eyes open, it doesn't matter. But we also have the stere stereoscopic, inf the stereopsis information. If you uh, close one eye or the other in succession, you'll see that the horizontal image moves, uh, uh, the, the image moves, moves uh, horizontally, left and right. And the brain uses this, uh, what we call horizontal disparity, to give you stereoscopic information. But uh, in either case, this information about the world gets put together along your visual pathway by neuronal mechanisms, and it is a brain construct. So, so you make up 3D in your brain every day. And artists, uh, not knowing a whole lot about uh, brain mechanisms, but having very fine intuitions about the human mind, have been able to exploit these principles and create uh, illusions in which uh, the subject of a painting may appear to jump out of the frame. This is another great example of how using the principles of perspective and illusion can 
uh, lead to a great work of art and that are very effective perceptually. This is the famous cupola of the San Ignatius Church in Rome. This is a, a faked cupola that is painted onto a flat ceiling. They had originally intended to have a real dome, but uh, they ran out of money and they used it for something else, and, and they had a flat ceiling and no dome. So, so they decided to hire brother Andrea Pozzo, a Jesuit brother, who was the world's expert at the, at the time in creating this type of illusion. And, and if you have the opportunity to visit this church in Rome, as Steve and I did some, some years back, there is a sweet spot, and, and you walk to it, and you look up, and you would swear, even knowing that the dome is, fall, is, is, is false, you would swear that it's real. And we're told that even today there are tourists that walk into this uh, beautiful church, marvelous art, and they look around, they look at the dome, and they walk out, and they never know any better. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really fun. And uh, Rome is actually a great place for, for illusions, especially in architecture, if you have an opportunity. This is another great example. This is the, the, the gallery, the famous uh, gallery in the Palazzo Spara. This gallery appears to be 121 feet long, perceptually. In reality, it's only 26 feet long. So how does this work? Well, the way, the way it works is that if you stand at this uh, end of the gallery, and you look in, and then you walk inside, as you're walking in, what's happening is that the, the ceiling is tilting down, and the floor is raising up. So the columns are actually longer at the entrance of the gallery than at the very end. So that, uh, that sculpture that you see in the far end that appears to be life-size, in reality, it's only like garden gnome size. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very effective illusion, and uh, you, know, you want to have a large room in a fourth of the size. That's uh, one way to do it. You can also take advantage of uh, the principles of perspective to create uh, anamorphic illusions. Rather than explain it, let me just uh, show you an example, and it will be very clear what this means. This is a great chalk artist, uh, Julian Weaver. He, uh, he created these, uh, these illusions on the sidewalk with his chalk. You can see him here. It looks like he's uh, dipping his foot in the water. But in reality, this is what he has drawn. And, uh, and again, like uh, Steve was saying, from a, from a very specific viewpoint, you see a very powerful illusion. From all other different viewpoints, the, the illusion obviously doesn't work. Now, so we have talked about um, some uh, illusions in art, some illusions uh, concerning perspective. Uh, I want to, to address, um, before we move on to the next topic, uh, illusions concerning faces. We have talked a little bit about uh, how visual processing uh, gets constructed along the visual hierarchy, but we don't have a whole lot of visual areas that are, uh, or neurons that are specific to particular objects. So we don't have uh, neurons that are specific, say, for um, detecting or perceiving bottles or chairs or tables. But we do have neurons and we do have uh, a specific brain area that is particularly specialized in face perception. And that is presumably because faces are so important to our day-to-day -day lives and our social interactions and uh, as social animals how we uh, live in the world. So this is the fusiform face area. And it's a region dedicated to, to face detection and because all of these, uh, a lot of these processes are already hardwired into how these neurons work. That means that they can also be tricked about visual information concerning faces and how it's presented. These neurons are making assumptions about reality that are not quite true. So, uh, as I mentioned, we're very attracted to faces. Uh, faces are an important focus of attention. We look at this picture. Uh, you see these are uh, father and son, they're enjoying the summer, they're enjoying their time together. And because we like to see the faces so much, you probably haven't noticed yet that there is something wrong with the boy's hand. Look closely. Okay, he has two thumbs. <laughs> but uh, it takes a while to realize just because our face detection neurons are so excited to have these two faces right here in plain sight that we're so attracted to. 
Or um, think about these other faces. This is uh, a very close-knit family, and uh, they all have the same face. <laughs> so you, you can see this is, this is why uh, nobody realizes that Superman and Clark Kent are the same person, <laughs> because they have different hair and, and the glasses, of course. <laughs> You can use um, all sorts of objects to, to make up faces, and if they have the right configuration, even though they have no actual face materials, you're going to have this strong perception of faces anyway. These are the famous uh, paintings by Archimboldo. These are portraits of uh, faces based on fruits and, and vegetables. This is a um, contemporary rendition of the, of the same concept. This is a, a vegetarian's nightmare, uh, <laughs> probably. And, and something that is interesting about how our visual neurons, our face perception neurons, um, detect faces is that, uh, well, as you, as you can imagine, because Steve already said, the brain is limited, we have limited resources, so we cannot be uh, worrying too much about, uh, say, seeing faces upside down, because how often do we walk into the world that we have to interact with a person that is uh, upside down and uh, we have to recognize their face? So we don't really care about upside down faces, and that's why when we look at this image, we see a bowl of vegetables, when, in fact, we have all sorts of face information right there when you make it go right side up. This is another uh, illusion based on the, on the same idea. So we have all these uh, three beautiful models. And if I, if I grab the picture, I forget how to rotate thing. Green what? Oh, the green dot. Oh, thank you. You're all more proficient power pointers than I am. So let me rotate it. And you can see that they're actually quite horrible. <laughs> let's, let's just put them back. <laughs> if I can. Oh, well. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> All right. So Steve mentioned how we can fill in gaps. We don't need to have a whole lot of information for us to perceive the world. And uh, in fact, what the, the visual information that enters our visual processing stream is, is, a, is a tiny fraction of what is out there. So we have to make all sorts of guesstimates to construct information. But in the case of face detection, we don't need a whole lot to conclude that there's a face there. This is the a poster for the Premonition movie with uh, Sandra Bullock. There is no actual face. If you look closely, all that we have are branches and leaves and birds. And yet we can see the, the face of the actress is, uh, is uh, perfectly detectable. And we can also see faces in objects that have nothing to do with faces, such as this, or that, or that. Faces everywhere. All right, so, so illusions then, just to, to recap, dissociate perception from reality, but uh, it is only in the cases, I mean, typically, uh, we call illusions to the cases in which this discrepancy between reality and perception is maximum, is exaggerated. But it is very rare the case where we have 100% correspondence. So most of what we perceive is at least partially illusory. Illusions reflect what the brain is actually doing. That's why they're so useful in neuroscience research. And just as we study illusions to understand the brain, artists use their intuitions about the mind to create illusions. And uh, we have talked about visual artists, but uh, in the second uh, half of the lecture, we are going to talk about how other types of artists, uh, such as magicians, use their intuition about the mind to create other types of illusions involving cognitive processes such as attention and memory and decision making. Now, uh, Steve already mentioned that, uh, that we both uh, uh, write the illusions column for Scientific American Mind. This is a special issue with uh, 10 of our articles that uh, came out 
a couple of years ago, and uh, you can you can check it out if you're interested in seeing more examples of uh, this type of illusions. We also uh, run, he mentioned briefly, the best illusion of the year contest. So this is a, a competition in which um, it, it, there's there's a trophy that goes to the best illusion that was created that year. We just uh, uh, hosted the ninth edition in uh, in Naples, Florida, uh, last uh, May 13th, just uh, just uh, just a few days ago. And uh, so the way that the contest works is anybody can submit an illusion uh, and, uh, and participate. And it has to be a novel illusion in any sensory modality. And it has to be unpublished or uh, for this last contest, published no earlier than 2012, so published no earlier than one year before the contest. And, and we have an international panel of judges uh, that varies every year and these judges are uh, illusion creators and uh, uh, all of them illusion experts. They can be illusion creators or science educators and communicators, artists interested in illusions. And what they do is they, they, select, it. they select it. the top 10 of uh, the dozens of submissions that we get every year. They select 10 based on the significance to mind and brain, the simplicity, aesthetic value, counterintuitive quality, and spectacularity, which we checked, it's a word. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the 10 uh, finalist illusions uh, are invited to, to compete. Uh, we, have, we host a big uh, gala event at the Philharmonic Hall in, in Naples, and uh, they each have five minutes to present their illusions, and the top three, they get uh, trophies that uh, this uh, Italian sculpture with uh, uh, Moretti creates uh, every year. The trophies are small, small versions of, uh, these, are, these are the huge versions, but, uh, but the trophies are illusions themselves. So you can see how this, this is the same object with three different perspectives. And the, and the trophies are based on that. And, uh, and the contest uh, has had a lot of public impact. We, uh, uh, the, that, that's the, that's the, uh, the Illusion Contest website, if you want to check it out, illusionoftheyear.com. Uh, if you go there, you can see our Illusions archive. So the top 10 from all the contest editions are already up. So there's uh, 90 Illusions that uh, you can enjoy. We have uh, collaborated with a number of science museums. And uh, there's been a lot of press related to, to that as well. This is from, um, from last uh, year's illusion, the, the one that won the first uh, trophy in 2012, and that we write every year a Scientific American article describing the, the top 10 illusions that make it to the contest. Uh, I want to show you an example from a, a top 10, a, 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 actually the first prize winner from 2007, this is the Leaning Tower illusion. So you can see that we have two pictures from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If I ask you which one is leaning more to the right, the left one or the right one, you'd say the right one. That works for me too. So now let's uh, actually let's just go here. And you all know PowerPoint better than me. So <laughs> I'm going to do copy and paste. It's exactly the same image, side to side, identical. But we see the image on the right leaning more towards the right than the illusion on the left. And this is uh, very interesting, uh, both in terms of what it tells us about our brain and our visual system in particular, but also the fact that it took to 2007 for somebody to realize that this was happening. Uh, with this type of image. So, so this was a, a lot of fun to see just because it's such a powerful illusion and yet so simple. The reason that it works is because our visual system, uh, think about the, again about the shortcuts that we take whenever we perceive the world, and going back to the principles of perspective, we are used to perceive that objects that recede into the distance are converging. So if we have two actual towers, these are the Petronas twi Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur, uh, they're side-to-side -to -side towers, and as you look up at them, 
you see that they converge as they recede. But unlike them, in the Leaning Tower illusion, we have the same tower side by side. These are not two towers in the world, but as we look at them, our visual system is treating them as two different towers that are ascending and receding. And because they're not converging, then our visual system concludes that it must be that in reality, they're separating instead. So this tells us something important about how our brain deals with information concerning perspective. And I want to show you um, a one last illusion from the, from the contest. This is also from a, from a few years back. And I like this particular illusion because something that we have seen in the contest and is that art and science are really beginning to fuse and to merge. We see that artists are much more informed. Just in the nine uh, past editions of the contest in, 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 the, in the last other uh, nine years, we're seeing a trend about how artists are much more informed about brain science and incorporating uh, neuroscience concepts into their artworks. And at the same time, we see that scientists try to incorporate some aesthetic value into, into their illusions. The illusion that you're going to see is still Magnolias, and uh, Michael Picard is a, a graphics design artist from the UK. Thank you. Here we go. So there is nothing actually moving in this image. All that is happening is that we have brightness modulations. So the luminance content is turning up and down in different regions of the image. And by manipulating this, you can get this powerful illusion of uh, magnolia leaves and petals undulating in the wind. Very nice illusion. All right, so I think that we can move on to the, to the second part. We're going to talk now about uh, magic illusions and the, and the neuroscience of magic. All right, so on to magic then. Uh, let me introduce you to Apollo Robbins, the gentleman thief. This is one of the magicians that uh, we have been collaborating with over the years. And uh, if, I could, if I could have the lights uh, down again just a little bit. Watch him manipulate this coin. And it's gone. So this is a fairly simple uh, magic trick. And you may wonder, as, uh, as we do, how does this happen in the brain? When we observe, this magic trick was actually happening. So let's review the first few stages of visual processing. Light enters the eye, neurons in the retina get stimulated, and impulses travel crossing the brain to the occipital cortex, the primary visual cortex, where you can see that we're already starting to obtain a spatial representation, a spatial map of the scene. And we will get back to this concept of spatial representation. And uh, <laughs> ignore the Spanish, this is uh, uh, got um, uh, transferred into this presentation. But uh, I, I wanted to show you just uh, one more visual illusion before we move on to, to cognitive illusions as uh, developed by magicians. And I like this particular illusion for two reasons. First, the historical significance. This is the first illusion ever documented. We can have the lights back up. It was uh, described by Aristotle over 2,000 th years ago. And uh, we call it today the waterfall illusion, although Aristotle first noticed it looking at a river. And he wrote that as he was looking at this river for a while, flowing water, and then he would shift his gaze and look at something that didn't move, say the rock next, the rocks next to the river, he would see that the rocks were moving. And these rocks were moving in opposite direction to the flow of water. So, and, and you can see this effect very well with a waterfall as well. 
So this is another type of adaptation illusion, like uh, Steve described earlier. It's, uh, we call this particularly a motion after effect. And, uh, and the second reason why uh, I, like it, uh, I like to show it to you now is that uh, I have a particular version that was developed by the magician Jerry Andrews, and he called it the trisonal space warp. And it looks like this. So what I'd like you to do here is stare at the very center of this swirling pattern, and we're gonna need to look at it for one minute or so, so don't, don't move your eyes, just keep them on the center. These three directions of motion that are happening in three different parts of your visual field, what they're doing is they're adapting your motion-sensitive neurons. So the motion-sensitive neurons that are selective to the opposite directions of motion are less tired, so to speak, so um, they're gonna be responding more. So keep looking at the center, don't look away. So when, when I ask you to look away, not yet, I would like you to look at the face of the person that you have sitting next to you. If you're sitting by yourself, you can look at the back of your hand and you should see these neurons do something interesting. Let's try it out right now. <laughs> so this, this is a motion after effect. And there's something, impor there's something important I forgot to tell you that uh, for about a third of the people who experience this illusion, it never completely goes away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so a few years ago then, uh, Steve and I started to, to collaborate with magicians because um, we, we realized that just as in vision science, we can take advantage of painters and other visual artists to accelerate the rate of discovery about brain principles uh, that underlie perception in the lab, if we want to know more about how cognition happens in the brain, we may be able to take advantage of cognitive illusions and awareness illusions. And who are the artists of attention and awareness? Well, it dawned on us that these are magicians. Magicians have been manipulating the attention and awareness of audiences for thousands of years. So even though they haven't been following the scientific method per se, they have been doing systematic research. And we've ha they have been examining all of these concepts uh, for much longer than cognitive neuroscience is. Cognitive neuroscience is only a few decades old. So magicians have a great advantage over us just in terms of their experience. Uh, with, this, with these issues, and in fact, when you look into it, you realize that in cognitive science, we have been very often reinventing the wheel and arriving to conclusions that the magicians already knew all along. So, so we, we published a paper uh, in, uh, in Nature Abuse Neuroscience uh, in 2008. This uh, was the, at the very beginning of our collaboration with the magicians, and you may recognize some of these names, Apollo Robbins I already introduced. Uh, there was uh, Teller from Penn and Teller, Johnny Thompson, the great Tom Sonny, Mac King, who's a champion of, uh, world champion of comedy magic and a headliner in uh, Harris in Las Vegas, and James Randi, who is the amazing Randi, whose uh, foundation offers the $1 million challenge for whomever can demonstrate uh, paranormal abilities in a control environment. The one million dollars is still available there if you'd like to <laughs> compete. <laughs> and, uh, and, we, and we followed up with a um, couple of articles for the, for the public as well that we published in Scientific American. All right, so what we described uh, in one of the um, insights that transpired from these conversations, these initial conversations with magicians, is that magicians not only use a whole lot of illusions in their acts, but they do it in a way that they reinforce each other. And this is different from what we do in the laboratory, because in the laboratory, typically, when we want to study uh, an effect, a perceptual effect, a, a given illusion, we're going to study that 
and nothing else. We're going to maintain everything else constant, so we don't have any type of confounding factors, and everything is going to be beautifully controlled, beautifully isolated. Magicians do the opposite. Magicians are going to be lumping illusions on top of illusions, and they're really going to foolproof every trick. So a trick that I may take like a two or three minutes to perform, they may have half a dozen of illusions that go into it or more. So it's virtually impossible for the spectator in the time that it takes to witness this magic trick to peel away all these onion layers of illusion. So magicians are going to use special effects. What I mean by that is same thing as the movies, so fake explosions or gunshots uh, on, on stage. They're going to use special devices and mechanical artifacts, what they call gimmicks, uh, optical illusions. Now here, this is an important difference between uh, optical illusions and visual illusions. So optical illusions have to do with the physical properties of light. We take a glass of water, we put a pencil in, it appears to bend. That's an optical illusion. It is due to different refraction indices of air and water. So the illusion happens in the world. A visual illusion or other sensory illusions involving audition and touch and so on, those are illusions that are created entirely in your mind. So the trisonal space warp that we experienced earlier or the celebrities turn ugly illusion that Steve showed before, those are illusions that don't happen in the world. Your brain makes them up for you. And uh, similarly with cognitive illusions, the difference between cognitive illusions and sensory illusions are simply at what level they take place in the hierarchy of processing of information in the brain. So cognitive illusions are going to be happening higher up in your brain, further away from the sensory input. And they're going to involve what we call cognitive processes, such as attention or memory or cause-effect uh, relationships or decision-making. Now today, we're going, for the remainder of this uh, presentation, we're going to talk particularly about cognitive illusions and uh, in, uh, especially the misdirection of attention as used by magicians. Now, misdirection, it's, uh, we were told to not use uh, big words. I think this is the only one that we're going to have in this presentation. And, uh, and this is a term that, uh, that magicians use. And what they mean by it is to manipulate or, or to manage the attention of the audience so that it's focused on the magical effect, which is what the audience hopefully perceives, and the attention is at the same time drawn away from the secret method, which is underlying this magical effect. Now, how do magicians do this? Well, they do it in two main ways, which we uh, have called overt and covert misdirection. Now, in overt misdirection, what the magician does is uh, he manipulates the gaze of the audience. So basically, the magician is going to get you to look over here while something else happens over there. And, and that is very effective. That works. Now, the potential problem is that if you're looking over there and then an elephant shows up on the other end of the stage and you're like, hold on. Well, I don't know what happened, but I was looking away, so who knows what the magician did. So if you realize that, then that diminishes the sense of magic. So how to get around this issue? Well, magicians have a more subtle, more uh, elegant uh, form of misdirection which is a uh, covert misdirection. And here they're going to be, they're going to manipulate the audience of the spectators without changing their position of gaze. Now think about this. Here you're going to be looking at the right place at the right time, but you're not going to detect the secret method because you're not paying attention. That is, you're paying attention somewhere else, or the magician has split your attention in different locations so that you become much less effective. And in this case, you're sure that you were looking at the right place at the right time, you, you didn't see how that could have possibly happened, so it feels much more magical. Now the problem is, you were looking, but you weren't seeing because you weren't paying attention. Now in cognitive neuroscience, we have a couple of uh, parallels with this uh, concept of covert misdirection, which we call change blindness and inattentional blindness. So now Steve already 
showed a little bit of an example of change blindness, which is basically something changes in front of us, but we don't realize that there's a change. Okay? Uh, like uh, when uh, people had to choose between the two photographs and they turn them upside down and then they swap them. There's a change, people don't realize that's change blindness. But I'm gonna show you a video that uh, illustrates this very well. This is uh, Darren Brown, he's a magician, a mentalist in the UK. And I like this uh, performance, it's a kind of a street magic performance based on a psychology experiment by Dan Simons. Now watch out for changes. Most of us think we're pretty observant, but with a bit of mind control, I wanted to see if I could make these people take even the most obvious things for granted. Excuse me. Do you know how to get to Trinity Church from here? Yeah. You see that church down there? Yep, straight through there. And there's a big cute thing down there. Go ahead, sorry. Excuse me. Did you notice the chain yet? And then you walk down two or three blocks and the tree church is over by the inside. We're walking in that direction. And he's gonna do it again. Trinity Church, is he? Might be Walt Stephen Broadway. Okay. Well, we're down here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah, you see. Okay, watch out for the swap. If you keep going that way, you went all the way, then you go on the four blocks. That seemed almost too easy. So later on, I see how far I can take it. Excuse me, do you know where uh, Trinity Church is? <laughs> okay. Uh, last time I switched with someone who looked a little bit like me, but where's the fun in that? You know who that's the right here? The other side, you see where the lady is standing? Sure. That's the pool, no, the lady in the gray. The other side? Yeah, the other side of the But you say you don't know where it is? Uh, exactly what street, no, but it's in that direction. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. okay? Thank you. Excuse me. Do you know where uh, Trinity Church is? From here. Yeah, fine. Come on, come on, I'll take you, or oh, you want to walk now? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch some other people. Sorry, sorry, sorry guys. Sorry. <laughs> okay, listen, thing. once you go on Broadway, yes. remember the numbers are going... <laughs> I think it's going to the back. Um, once you hit the Broadway, you're going down. Yes. Walk up straight so that, that way, way and just walk straight down. You're going to see it, right? It's really brown. That's brilliant. Thanks for your help. All right, fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He said, I thought you were another guy. You know where Trinity Church is? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where are we on here? Are we sort of there. Right there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> she's a bit suspicious, but she's not sure yet. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we can have very big changes happening in front of us. I'm, I'm sure that if they had asked any of you in advance, do you think that you would have noticed? And sure, no problem. But the fact is that we fall for this kind of thing. And even knowing how susceptible we are to change blindness, as you now are, uh, we still have trouble detecting changes. And we're going to do a little exercise just so, so you can see how susceptible we are. So I'd like to show you a little video. And, uh, and what I would like you to do is uh, to see if you notice any changes throughout. And those changes can be anywhere. And that I notice that I'm saying in the plural changes, that's more than one. So I'd like to I'd like you to count them silently, and, uh, and then you can tell me at the end if you were able to find any. Okay. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts 
at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take oh. her away. That's right, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? All right. How observant were you? Did anybody see any changes? Yeah? More than one? Two? Three? Five? Eight? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody more than eight? Nine. I, I think you're just uh, making it up now. Well, I'm, I'm very disappointed, but uh, there were actually 21 changes. <laughs> Let's check them out. Here we go. Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of Dead you to guy. tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Huh. Well, we can have the lights back up now. So, so it, it's very hard. It's um, a task like this is not just a challenge on your memory, but it's also a challenge on your attention. And the fact is that uh, uh, under the pretense of helping you at the beginning, I was trying to make it even a bit harder for you, because you may recall that I told you that the changes could be everywhere, there were going to be multiple changes. I was hoping that you would be switching your spotlight of attention around the scene. Now, you might have been more effective if you had chosen to just stay on a region of the, of the scene, no matter what happened. I bet you would have been able to find more changes. But that's not what we do in real life. It's not what we do in a magic show, either. So, in fact, uh, you may not be surprised to know that there are m magic tricks that are specifically designed to split your attention. Think of the cups and balls. This is typically done with three cups, and the magician moves them around, and balls appear and disappear under the cups. And automatically, you have to split your attention in three different places. And you may be thinking, well, I'm going to be one third of as effective as I might be otherwise. The fact is that you're far, far less effective than that. And now I'm going to hand it over to Steve to tell you all about inattentional blindness and to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. OK, so Susanne has shown you how susceptible you are to change blindness, especially when British people tell you some very weak sexual innuendos. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is look at not only change blindness. If you think about change blindness, something happened, then there was a disruption, and then you saw the thing again, but something changed. So in a way, you have to compare it across a disruption. So it's a memory illusion, if you think of it that way. And, but you can actually manipulate your attention even without memory playing a role. And so let's try that. That's called inattentional blindness. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a demonstration here in which something's going to change. And what, what I want you to do is follow the, the task that you're given on the movie explicitly, very, very well. Do, do your best job. If you don't, you may not experience the illusion, and then it's absolutely no fun for me. And so the, uh, um, it's important that you follow the task. And by the way, if you've seen this demonstration before or something like it, many of you have, just stay silent, and in fact, if any of you, any of you, you know, feel any pleasure or, or for whatever reason, just stay silent during the whole thing until the end, please, so that you don't uh, give anything away. And so here we go, uh, demonstration of inattentional blindness. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Okay. 
Okay, lights up please. I need to be able to see the audience. Thank you. Um, so how many passes did the team in white make? Anybody? 13. 13 is a good number. Raise your hand if you got 13. Oh wow, a lot of you. Okay, keep your hands up now. Keep your hands up. No, so th those of you who got 13, put your hands down. Not yet. Uh, let me. Put your hands down if uh, you saw the dancing bear. Oh, almost, not, uh, almost none of you saw it. Okay, good. So how many of you with your hands up have seen this demonstration before? With your hands up. None of you, right? Okay, <laughs> that's good. Because if you didn't see the dancing bear, but you've seen this before, you need to see your neurologist. <laughs> so the, uh, but let's go through this again, because there was a dancing bear in the movie, and it wasn't the small little thing. Thank you. It wasn't a small little thing. It was a big thing, big guy like me. Uh, moonwalking, as a matter of fact, poorly. And, uh, and you missed it, okay, which is incredible. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at it. I might be exaggerating slightly the, the magnitude of the bear moonwalking. So I'll, I'll circle it for you just in case you miss it again. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So let's rewind. And here we go. Again, think Moonwalking Bear, you might miss it. It's very small. What is wrong with you people? You guys are making my medicine? <laughs> Jesus. Okay, so. In actuality, the fact that you missed the moonwalking bear means your brains are working well, okay? What your task was, was to count the number of passes by the white team. And you did that extremely well to the detriment of everything else, right? But that's what your job was. That's what your task was. And your attentional system was helping you out by enhancing the basketball passes and the team in white and filtering out everything else. How many of you counted the passes of the team in white and the team in black? None of you. Too hard, right? Because you filtered out everything that wasn't important. And that's an important clue as to what attention is doing. And this is what some of the things cognitive neuroscientists can do in order to find out how the brain's actually working. So in this case, we have enhancing the task and suppressing everything else. So now we have something to look for when we go in the brain to find out how this is actually working. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the attentional spotlight. Here we have two young women. They live together. They're having a chat here. This young woman here is telling her friend, her, her housemate, about her boyfriend problems again for the seventh time this week. Okay? And she, being a very polite uh, friend, is paying very close attention to her friend and giving her lots of sympathy, it appears, when in fact we all know what she's actually uh, paying attention to <laughs> is over here. So, what is going on here? Isn't this peculiar behavior, right? Well, it's polite, that's nice. And, and we all perceive this as being the right thing to do. But let's think a little bit about what's actually being done here, okay? I want you to hold your thumbs out at arm's length in front of you, okay? While your arm is at arm's length, your thumbnail is about one degree of visual angle wide, which means that if you had 360 thumbs, it would make a circle all the way around your head, okay? Now what that means is that thumbnail is approximately 0.1% of your entire visual field. It's the area of one one thousandth of your entire visual field, okay? Now that thumbnail is the only place in your visual field while you're looking at it that you can actually see, okay? Let me say that again. Everywhere else except your thumbnail when you're looking at it at arm's length, you're legally blind. You can't read the newspaper. You can't read anything. You can't see anything worth a damn outside your thumbnail at arm's length. That's why we have eye movements. When you walk into a room, you move your eyes around, you get the high quality vision on the various surfaces of the room. You take that very sparse information, it goes into that part of your brain that creates a simulation of the world, which builds a model of this room for you that allows you to walk through it without stepping on other people's toes and things like that, without having seen every single thing in the, in the room. 
And that's how you are able to navigate, for example, okay? So if that's the case, if we can only see in the very center of our vision, why is it that that young woman is looking at her friend but paying attention to the visual garbage in her periphery, which is the chocolate cake? How is it that humans can even hope to move their attention to a place where there's almost no visual information at all? Why would we want to do that? Well, one of the reasons we want to do that, we think, is because we want to be able to deceive other people. And I don't mean that in the cynical sense. I don't mean that in the sense of tricking other people, but I mean that that's part of being polite. Every time you're being polite, it's a form of a deception, okay? And part of interpersonal relationships that are very important to how we interact with each other. Now, the, uh, give you an example. If you, scientists have, have watched monkeys in St. Kitts, groups of wild rhesus macaque monkeys as they roam through the, the prairies of, of, of uh, St. Kitts Island, and they put food treats out in the paths where the troops will go through every day. And when a monkey finds a treat, it makes a call to the other monkey saying, there's food here, okay? And they all come and they share it, okay? There's a pecking order, but still, it's basically a form of altruism to do that. Now, they also sometimes put very high quality treats in the field. And when that happens, when the monkey finds one, they look over there and say there's food, okay? The other monkeys see the position of that monkey's gaze and they go over there looking for the food which isn't over there. And that gives this monkey a little more time to get the good stuff for himself, okay? How human is that, okay? How about this room's full of CEOs? I don't have to explain this. So, so it's part and parcel to human behavior to not necessarily want everybody to know exactly what you're thinking or exactly what you're paying attention to at any given time. And our visual system's internal structure and the structure of our cognitive systems betray that evolutionary necessity in our personal interactions. This is a very cool illusion because it's the first one where we will have actually able to measure directly attention and its magnitude. So the examples we've shown you before of how attention affects things were basically indirect. So we give you performance measures. You looked at something, paid attention to something, and you either did well or poorly based on where we had you paying attention while something else happened. So it was a performance measure of visual attention, so it's an indirect measure of it. This was the very first illusion where we could measure attention directly. I, could you turn down the lights again, please? So what you do is you fixate, this is by Peter C. at Dartmouth University. It's just a few years old. It was a, com a competitor, top 10 competitor in, one, in our very first illusion contest. You fixate on this green dot and pay attention to the upper white circle and it actually gets brighter than the other two, okay? Now pay attention to the upper left one and now that's brighter than the other two. Now pay attention to the bottom one. It's brighter. Go back up there. It's brighter. Okay, now use your own free will, if you think you still have any, and make any one of those dots light up by changing your position of what you're paying attention to. Who here thinks I control their attentional spotlight? None of you. That's incorrect, but nevertheless, uh, I'm not controlling it now. So, how is this working? How is it that you can take a network of inanimate neurons, you put them in a dish, you put neurotransmitter on them, they fire just like they're firing now, except the dish is called the brain pan, okay? And they're making circuits. In this case, these circuits form a network that's animate. So you take a bunch of inanimate neurons and somehow they become an animate when they're in that configuration. So that's the real mystery of what's going on. And especially with, for example, how attention works. And so we did some research in the brain to find out. So remember, the clues here are, you've got light reflecting off the magician, it enters the visual system, it's transduced into electrochemical signals which traverse the optic nerve into the lateral geniculate nucleus and go back to the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain where a map is formed of the visual information. Now that's an important clue because attention is spatial as we've shown you before. It has a spatial uh, uh, extent to it. Uh, at least in some of the forms that we've been showing you and in some of the magic tricks we've been showing you. So in this case, 
Apollo is getting you to pay attention to this hand where the coin isn't. And by doing that, you enhance that hand and you suppress everything else, including where the coin is, okay? So magicians are using basically a form of mental jiu-jitsu to use your own powers of attention against you, yourself, okay? So how is that actually working? And this is basically how it works. You have the attentional focus in space where you're paying attention, and in the surround, you're suppressing all the distractors. What we discovered by doing uh, recordings in the brain uh, while subjects actually paid attention to things is we could see that the focus was actually mediated by certain uh, very local inhibitory neurons, whereas the surround, the distracted suppressed neurons were actually pyramidal excitatory neurons. And these, are the, these neurons here, these big pyramidal neurons that are excitatory are the ones that connect to other brain areas. So we thought those would be the neurons that would be enhanced in the center, sending the information, but that wasn't the case. It turns out what attention is, is the suppression of all the noisy neighbors. And what's happening in the center is the enhancement of neurons that then suppress the noisy neighbors. So in the center of where you pay attention to in space, the neurons are not enhanced and they're not suppressed, but the neighbors are suppressed, so you get a net enhancement, okay? So that's what attention is, and that's very critical for us to understand how attention's working, for example, in cognitive decline, in Lennox Gasto or other forms of epilepsy, in, in all forms of Alzheimer's disease, in certain other diseases, even ALS has cognitive decline to some extent. So we also found that this uh, is increased as a function of task difficulty, which is why people who do a good job of counting the basketball passes miss the dancing bear. The harder you do the task at hand, the more you suppress the noisy neighbors, the more you suppress the irrelevancy, okay? So, in the brain, this is what's going on. We looked at these neurons. This neuron is on the hand of Apollo, for example, in the primary visual cortex, and these are the neurons in the surround. These neurons are all uh, sensitive to motion, okay? So when Apollo steals a coin from one hand and, and moves it, you actually get, these neurons are excited by the motion of that hand, and here's what happens. This neuron gets excited by the motion of the steel from one hand to the other. You're paying attention to that hand, and by doing that, in, uh, cognition, attention, enhances the inhibitory neurons which suppress everything in the surround, okay? That's what our research is showing is how this works, and it's the explanation for this illusion. Now let me show you Apollo Robbins, the gentleman thief in his natural environment. Uh, as we biologists like to study things in their natural environment, this is uh, him stealing from inebriates in Las Vegas. Um, and let's talk about that. That's a nice ring, man. It's tight good for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Hmm, it doesn't really work for me either. Do you have another one? <laughs> Sorry about that. It looks like the one I'm wearing, doesn't oh! it? Oh! <laughs> yeah, you gotta hold on to that, man. Don't lose it. Oh, yeah. Well, it's gonna be on the down just a little bit lower. Hold on. No, no, no. Well, the only thing is discovery about this is that we end up with this. Does this belong to you, man? Check it out. And you had something down here, too, didn't you? Hey, let me see. We can see if we can make this go just a little bit further. It should have a little familiar ring to it. It's just like the coin we were playing with a while ago, man. Bunch of clubs. I threw my ring in the Well, I didn't turn your ring, I just put it in another place. Down by your pocket, there was a ring, man. Does that belong to you? You can give that back to him. Is that your ring, man? No. You better put that on before we go. Yeah, that's cool. Now, this coin, did you see the date on the coin? It's 1964. 64 is special. There's a reason why that's special. I'll tell you why exactly. You have a wallet on you, right? I do. Yeah? Did you have cash as well? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I was checking for some cash right down here by your pocket. Down here, you had not a whole lot of stuff. This is interesting. It turned it up. While we were looking at that coin, you with a Sprint cell phone. That's the kind that you have, isn't it? I would use that to call if you're missing any cash and stuff like that. To be honest with you guys, after you have something like that happen, natural reaction, you're going to want to have a cigarette. Is that the kind that you smoke, man? That is the kind you smoke. Bring out your pack. Where's your cigarettes, man? I don't know. I don't know. Right there? Right here. Ah, this would be the rest of them. They're all right here, man. Right, so you keep the cigarettes. No, I'm not like one was up. Sorry about that. Oh, you broke one. Oh, broke one. Well, that's a lucky one. That's lucky. That's tradition. Lights up, please. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, man. Good job. Thank you, sir. So Apollo is uncanny. Okay, he's a Jedi master, 
and these aren't the droids you're looking for, right? What's happening here is everything that you saw him hand back to them was stolen, not only in front of them, but in front of all of you, okay? Every single thing. Those cigarettes were taken, and he was using all sorts of methods to do this. He was distracting them not only by getting to look at specific things, but also by touching them in certain places, sometimes putting his hand in their pockets and coming out with nothing, making them think that he wasn't stealing something. Sometimes he was getting them to have internal dialogues with themselves so they were paying attention to nothing in the world and he could basically get away with magical murder. And one case was where he had the person have a coin, right? At arm's length, about the size of a thumbnail, hmm, right? And there, were, there was something special about that coin, right? What was the date on the coin? Right, and, and, and what was the special thing about the coin? Ah, it was a big fat lie. There was nothing special about the coin. He got them to look at this coin and pay very close attention to it, and you too, there was nothing about it, except that he, that was when he stole the cigarettes and why you all missed it, okay? So it's just incredible what these folks can do, and, and we need to understand all of these things, and if we're going to basically create cognitive experiments that we can take to the lab, make them as powerful as possible to increase the rate of discovery and cognition, and test our drugs that affect cognitive decline with the most gain, okay? So, multitasking is a myth. If you could multitask, if you had multiple attentional spotlights that you could use all at once, magic tricks wouldn't work, okay? And what does this mean for you? Well, it means don't text and drive, for one. That's a bad move. Reduce distractions in your workplace. Your kids, your grandkids, where they're doing their homework, don't leave the TV on. <laughs> Remove these toys from your desk. Toys on your desk do exactly what they're designed to do, which is to distract you from what your job is. So uh, also, don't miss opportunities. So you pay too, too close attention to things that are not that important. You might miss things that are much more important. Magicians also disarm with charm. So one of the things that they do is they use jokes in order to uh, control your attention. In a magician show, one of the things we've learned is that humor is used chore very choreographically to suppress attention so that they can get away with anything. While you're laughing, you can't pay attention. And finally, uh, one thing magicians do, which we admire very much, is they recover from their missteps. So when they make a mistake, they just move on. Half the people aren't going to notice it anyway. And you should do that too. Okay. So, uh, if you learn nothing else from us today, attention enhances one small part of the world while suppressing everything else. When making difficult decisions, list all the facts. This is one way to deal with this. Consider each ramification in turn, paying attention to each one while you suppress everything else. Your attentional spotlight will enhance each issue while suppressing the others. And once you reach the end of the list, you will have a full picture based on both hardcore facts and your gut feelings. Your gut feelings might be promoted to hardcore facts by doing this, and some of the hardcore facts may be thrown away as being trivial if you do this well and you don't take it all in at once. And by the way, this, you should do this in your advertisements. The people who look at your advertisements should look at it in a sequence, drawing their attention to the important points. When you're a doctor and you're explaining instructions to your patients, there shouldn't be lots of stuff happening. There should be a very clear sequence of events so that they can clearly learn it and pay attention to things, especially if they have cognitive decline. When you're teaching your children in their school, there should be one point to every class. If every kid learned the, everything they needed to learn from every lecture they got, just one thing, they'd all be going to Harvard, okay? So this is an important point that in teaching, even with people who aren't sick, having them focus at the right time and at the right place using these types of skills is incredibly important. And then you can decide. And the, we believe that this is what critical thinking actually is in the brain. Thank you very much. This is my um, conflict of interest statement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> act accordingly. Thank you. Just a couple of brief questions, please. Some people have deficits in facial recognition of 
face detection. And I wonder how, how they respond to the um, uh, celebrities turning into monsters. It's actually what I'm you pointing at you. <laughs> you. It's, a, it's a very new illusion. It's a only a one year old, two years old at most. And so to, to my knowledge, it hasn't been tested with uh, anybody who has a perceptual deficit. But it's a good question. There, are, there is a disease called face blindness or prosopagnosia. And Susanna has a mild form of it. Uh, <laughs> Every senior neuroscientist at one form or the other claims to have prosopagnosia when they forget someone's name. But, uh, Are you calling me senior? Huh? Are you uh, calling me a senior sorry, neuroscientist? I, I <laughs> sorry. In your, in your diagrams of the brain, hi, here. Uh, in your diagram, you suggested that, say, the hand or the coin formed its own map right in a unique location. My reading of the literature suggests something different, and I'm wondering if you were just simplifying the reality. Uh, my understanding is that even something as simple as a graph with a vertical and a horizontal line, those lines could be placed in different parts of the brain, and when we recall it, our, we have the task of pulling it back together again. Uh, does that conflict with your interpretation? I'm trying to understand it. It depends on the level of the brain. So on the retina, for example, it's a part of the brain. It's absolutely have to do with visual space and nothing else. So the graph is there. They're related to each other in space. As you go into the brain, you keep the retinotopic space, that is real space, for a few levels. And then it starts to split up, split up into objectotopic space. So specific objects are mapped with a relationship to each other, partially in space and partially in concept. Okay. And so as you go higher into the visual system, things become more conceptual and less spatial. So you're right, but so are we. It's, it's all true. So <coughs> what happens to your 3D vision if you lose vision in one eye? That's one question. And a second, say, as an adult, and what happens if you're born, say, with a defect in one eye? And another question is, are there any organisms uh, that have a 2D vision um, or, or in other words, where did the 3D uh, vision evolve? So if you lose uh, vision in one eye, uh, either as an adult or if you're uh, born, say, with uh, uh, a, a amblyopia, a, what happens is that uh, you're not going to be able to have stereoscopic vision, but are you still going to have the monocular depth perception cues. So the, the cues that you use to detect um, a 3D in a picture or in a painting, uh, or when you watch a regular uh, non-3D movie at, at, at home or in, the, or in the theater, those cues you're going to be able to use in real life as well. But, uh, but you're not going to be able to uh, use uh, stereoscopic cues to depth perception. And that, uh, and you can see as uh, most of us uh, who uh, who are be able to use both types of cues, if you cover one eye and then try to um, a, a thread a needle, you're going to have a hard time doing that. But uh, if you have had this all your life, then you can get around these issues with training. And the uh, we're not evolutionary biologists, so we don't know exactly when. Uh, 3D vision with two eyes came about, but it's thought that it came about with predatory behavior. And most animals actually don't have 3D vision from the two eyes, don't have stereopsis or much. Most animals have their eyes on the two sides of their head. So it's only uh, primates and other predatory animals like cats and things like that, that and, and mammals and others that, that predate, uh, you know, have their eyes together so that they can use distance as an important clue to catch. But, but right. here we're talking again about stereopsis. The uh, monocular cues to depth perception, you know, knowing that one object is behind it based on occlusion cues, for instance, it, those uh, may occur in all sorts of uh, animals, and uh, including vertebrates and insects. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that, uh, that you would have cues to depth perception uh, based on most uh, organisms that use the visual system, and you're going to have also parallax from motion, and that's going to give you a cue against uh, a about distance and depth as well. Okay, we better finish there. Thank you, Susanna and Steve. <laughs>